Hello, welcome to um, Houston Media Sources Public Affairs, Public Access Broadcast. My name is Fran Watson and I'll be your host this evening. Um, in the news in the past couple of years, there may have been some names that have come up, come up. And if you look on the screen, you'll see these names. Mike Brown, Tamir Rice, Trayvon Martin, Eric Gardner. These have been people that have been killed or brutalized by either excessive um, force or by um, vigilante justice. So while we may have heard of these names, I mean, there has been a split in the community, a divide in the community. People have been arguing on why these people were killed, why these people were murdered, whether or not it should have happened, whether it was justified. But what about some other folks that we don't talk about, that maybe the general public hasn't spoken about? And that is these eight trans women that have been killed, murdered, since the beginning of 2015. And that's not even to talk about the folks that have been either one, they haven't been reported, or because the media has misgendered these women that their names have gone unnoticed. So today we're here to talk about the institutions, the institutional lies, the social phobias and isms that have continued to oppress and marginalize certain populations. I'm talking about racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, Islamophobia, and that's just to name a few. We have our panel here today, and we'll be talking about these words that may seem uncomfortable to some people, but for folks who have experienced, who have been the targets of these behaviors, there have been all kinds of loss, whether it's a loss of access, an opportunity to certain things in life, or whether it's a loss of life, just like those people that you've seen in the graphic today. And I didn't even mention the folks like Leela Alcorn, who's taken their life to suicide because of bullying and, 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 and different um, things of that nature. So before the panel introduces themselves, or I introduce the panel, I wanna make sure that I invite you to be a part of the panel. Please call in and be a part of the discussion. You can call in with questions or comments at 713 807-1794. Again, that's 713-807-1794. So let's introduce our panelists. Right here we have Danny Norris, who is an attorney and also a legal academic. We have uh, Kristen Anderson, who is a professor for, with University of Houston Downtown and with the Center of Critical Race Studies. We have Atlantis Capri, who is a trans and HIV advocate. And we have Brandy Holmes, who is a community activist on the ground. So let's go ahead and just set the stage and have a, let's have a working definition on what is racism. Um, Chris, do you wanna start with you and, and just kinda of let's define racism. Sure, thanks Fran. So racism is a system of inequality based on the assumption, um, the belief that white people are superior to non-white people. And we call racism a system of inequality because we wanna differentiate it from just individual prejudices, like, oh, I don't like those people, I like these people. But when you say that something is a system of inequality, what that means is that our institutions, our, our um, cultural rituals, our laws, our practices are essentially all based on that assumption of whites being superior to people of color. And when we talk about racism and how does that manifest? Are there, are there forms? I know you said that it's a, a, an institution. Um, how does that manifest itself? And I mean, that could be for anyone you know, on the panel to answer that. But where do we, where do we see where racism manifests itself? I, I could say a, a few places. Um, we see, well, you turn on the news and you can see it manifests uh, a lot of it, a lot of the outcry uh, for the, a lot of the police incidents have been because the, it has manifested itself where people, uh, communities of color felt like they were being unfairly targeted. We saw the, uh, the, the court decision that was brought up about stop and frisk in New York, and that was uh, where the court actually said, and, uh, and in Ferguson, where they were saying the police were particularly targeting 
communities of color. So uh, those are just uh, short examples, but that's before uh, going into resumes. We hear that we know that people with more ethnic sounding names are less likely to get calls back. We know that happens with loans. Some people of color have issues getting uh, getting uh, same access to uh, loans or, or or things that they're they're not uh, they're that people uh, who are not of color uh, may may get. Um, so just this uh, a number of things. Those are just a couple of examples where you, you have uh, people who are being uh, dis disadvantaged basically based on uh, just based on uh, typically based on their skin color wow. or, or being different because uh, it's not just skin color it's other other factors but skin color is one uh, that has been uh, brought up a lot as of late. Yeah. So a lot of times and this is something I want to talk about if if people are at this disadvantage, if people aren't able to, um, if they're, 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 like you said about the citing the studies about um, ethnic sounding names or things like that, um, what then, why does everybody talk about this race card? It's, they're saying that this race card is the reason why, you know, if things aren't happening, then it's because we're pulling the race card. And if we pull the race card, then we're able to get this advantage. But it seems like that this advantage still isn't here. So, um People of color are accused of playing the race card when they bring up racism, mm -hmm. when they accuse a person or an institution of being racist. The, the problem with that term is that it assumes that the playing field is level and that the status quo is equality, that there's no racism until a person of color brings up race, that if you just wouldn't bring it up, if you wouldn't see racism everywhere, there would be no racism. And of course, that's not true because that ignores the systematic and systemic nature of racism. And so we can't assume that the playing field is level until a black person brings up race. We have to understand how people of color are systematically um, discriminated against. And when they um, point that out, um, they're pointing out something that's unequal. If, don't, um, if you feel comfortable or anyone, is there any time that you have felt this um, type of um, systematic oppression, this racism, or, or have seen it happen in families or things of that nature? I mean, I'm sure we all have. You know, at some point in our life, we have seen it when we go apply for jobs or when we go to, um, when we deal with people. Like, you'll see them handle your white counterpart a certain way, and then when they come to you, they already have their defense up. You know, so, so therefore, the message to us is that you don't think we're important enough to even talk to us. So therefore, it's portraying to us that we're not important. So if we're not important, why do, why are we even here? So a lot of times that affects the mental and just the way we view things or how we go after things in life. Because if we feel like that door is already shut to us, why should we even fight it or push it? You know, we're out there pushing it, but the book, some people don't have that esteem to say, oh, I want to deal with this confrontation every day. So that's the thing. And, and I've seen it in the instance in, in when the oppressed speak against a system that benefits some, right? Mm -hmm. So anytime that system is challenged, that's when the term you're throwing the race card comes out. So, so the systems that we have identified that are broken, right? Those systems that are broken that they basically need to be dismantled and reconstructed. When those things are challenged, right? And it benefits that group that is doing the oppressing. Of course, oh, you're throwing the race card. Oh, you're just trying to play to that advantage. And, and that in and of itself, I've seen that a number of different times when we're talking about promotions and jobs and when we're talking about um, the affirmative action and we're talking about these things that uh, attempt to give uh, fair and just treatment to all people that that is challenging, right? That is challenging to those folks who are oppressing others. So it's not welcomed, right? Because you, you're trying to change my system. This system works for me. Mm -hmm. it might not work for you, but it works for me. And now you're trying to get me to change that? Oh, no. So how, what is a way, what about personal responsibility? Here's the thing, I hear about this. I hear about, you know, personal responsibility. What if, you know, we just get out there and, and, and I've worked from the ground up. I've heard people tell stories that they've worked from the ground up and that, that they've made something of themselves. It's not because of their color. It's not because of their gender. It's not because of this. It's because they 
we're able to just get out there and do things. So what about that? What about taking personal responsibility? What about dressing up when it's time to dress up or doing what needs to be done to the, get it done? The bootstrap, the, the infamous uh, bootstrap, pull yourself up by your bootstraps mm -hmm. uh, argument. <laughs> I, and I actually I saw an article not too long ago. Um, I think it was, it was a gentleman explaining why he left the, uh, the, the, the GOP, why he left the GOP, and he was making mention that his whole life he had been a member of, the, you know, very far right, uh, far right on the political spectrum. And he said after some experiences, he re came to realize that whole bootstrap, even though he thought it was more like going from JV to varsity, whereas it's more like going from, you know, T-ball to the World Series. It is a, it's a phenomenal task uh, if you're coming from a broken school uh, where you're going to start off, uh, first of all, you're going to start probably not having any access to pre-K uh, pre, uh, education. So you're going to start off behind. You're going to go to a school that's probably insufficient, uh, has very lacking resources. You're going to have prob possibly have lacking resources in your community. And you're supposed to compete with the person who has every single thing to their fingertip. If they, if they need anything, they have, uh, they have it at their disposal, plus some. They have tutors. They have all these different things, and you're supposed to be able to compete. You're, you're going to take this child who has no uh, no support uh, or a very little support, very meager support, and and they're supposed to be able to compete at the same level as this person who has had every support from basically from birth, and that is that is not logical. There are always a few exceptions. There's always somebody who comes to that that is phenomenally uh, gifted uh, from seems almost you know, in a lot of ways, but. It's very. It's not. It's, it's very. Uh, it's not very common. So the mass of, of people, the, the bulk of the mass bulk of people, in the that uh, in those disadvantaged groups, never are. That the whole bootstrap argument just doesn't hold water. Usually, they. It's just too. It's just too. Uh, too much for most people to overcome. And you know, um, you know, we all work hard. Um, you know, I earned um, a doctoral degree, and I worked really hard earning that degree. But I also had benefits that, um, because of my race and because of my social class, um, and because of the schools I went to. So, sure, I you know I worked my butt off to get um, my degree, but other people work just as hard as me, and they don't get to where I am, or they have to work much more, you know, their, their struggle is much more. So we can't simply say that um, the way we explain inequality is because some people work hard and some people don't, or some people are smart and some people aren't. No, we, you know, we all work hard. That doesn't explain why some of us are advantaged and some of us aren't advantaged. I mean, yeah, because the thing I agree with Chris, we are forgetting about what's the difference is our social economic status. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I come in, if she has a full plate and I have half a plate, how do you expect me to compete with that? When I'm already trying to play catch up to get a full plate, and while I'm getting to that full plate, she's progressing a little bit more. So that thing is like we, it can't be some personal because we're not, we don't have all the tools there, or we don't have all the benefits and all the things that they may have. And I think that's really for that's forgotten that people try to utilize that and say, oh, well, you could do this if everybody else did that. No, every, it's a different situation for anyone. I mean, like the old saying, you weren't raised in my house, so you don't, I can't tell you how this is going to work for you if you weren't raised there. And a lot of times those people that are saying that are people who have made it and have forgotten where they came from, or people who have never been in their area or their arena. And the idea, so if you do pull yourself up by your own bootstraps, right? So say, for instance, you do come from one of these these uh, backgrounds where, you know, regardless of the outside circumstances, you were somehow able to overcome these insurmountable odds. There are systems in place that won't allow you to progress, right? So when we think about this and we think about some of the racism that exists in different organizations or depending upon what you're attempting to do, even if you do continue to pull yourself up, okay? So say, for instance, I am able to get this degree. I'm able to get this graduate degree. After I exit, if my name doesn't look crispy on a resume, I may not have the opportunities that have been afforded to you based upon your privilege, like we just addressed that. So you may be able to pull yourself up, but these systems exist. These systems are in place to keep those folks oppressed. So pull yourself up by all means. I think we do all have to take some level of personal responsibility and accountability for our actions. But if there's a system in place that is designed to hinder me and to basically thwart all of my growth, how am I supposed to succeed? How am I supposed to thrive in those situations? Mm -hmm. Well, let's move a little bit. Um, I want to talk about um, the media and, and how we see these differences in the media. One thing I wonder, and, and I want to put this out here, do 
we believe that the media is actually perpetuating this racism, perpetuating the thoughts, these stereotypes, all of this, um, or do we believe that it exposes it, that gives us the opportunity to um, do something about um, ending racism? And that may be a lot to unpack. Hmm. Um, I would say it probably depends on, well, there's a lot of forms of media now, uh, but I think traditionally the media has per perpetuated a lot of uh, stereotypes. I think media can be used to do, uh, it can be used to expose them and it can be used to uh, ex stereotypes and it can be used to, uh, to perpetuate them. Uh, tr uh, traditionally, the media has perpetuated a lot of things. Um, I think a lot of, uh, it, it, I mean, and now it's controlled and it's only still only controlled by just a few people. So, you know, it's, the media is still really for the interest of just a few, a handful of people. So, I mean, a handful of, uh, it, you know, invested individuals. So ultimately it's still just their, their bottom line and, you know, they're gonna go typically with what gets ratings. So if it's, if it's race, uh, or if it's police uh, brutality, if that catches fire, then they are going to go after it. Um, you know, the Trayvon Martin uh, trial was on 24-7, almost seems like, because uh, that was hot news. Uh, the O.J. Simpson trial was on 24-7. That was, that was what, what uh, got, got uh, ratings. So uh, they're going to go for what, what, what gives ratings. And if the, 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 public, uh, the public tends to have a craving for um, some of these, uh, uh, unfortunately, still, the public still has a craving to, to see these things. <clears throat> Excuse me, and uh, some of those stereotypes do persist just because the the public uh, craves it, and when the public craves it, the media is going to give it to them because ultimately they're trying to they're trying to boost their own ratings. So my favorite form of uh, media right now is social media, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, social media has just transformed the game as it relates to writing our own narrative and changing the story that's being told. Uh, because, of course, right, media does sensationalize things. Let's think about the Super Bowl ads, how many millions of dollars are contributed just so that you can have a 30-second or 15-second ad space in the Super Bowl. So when you think about that, money buys space, money buys time, sensationalism buys time. So social media is just, I mean, I can pull out my iPhone and I can capture whatever I want. So as we look at these different protests that are occurring across the world in Baltimore and Ferguson, if you want to know what's going on, if you want to know the true story, instead of how valuable this CVS is that's burning in Baltimore, if you want to know what's actually happening on the ground, then you want to go ahead and tune into Instagram and you want to go ahead and tune into Twitter and you want to make sure that you're watching. There's new live stream apps that are just incredible. Periscope, Meerkat, not trying to pub them. Mm -hmm. I don't get anything for this, but I think they're really powerful tools because now I can live stream anything anywhere. So now you can really see the true story. I can watch my local news channel and see the story that they choose to air, which in a particular instance, there was a protest here in Houston and there were media uh, out there at that protest. And one television station actually did report the story accurately as to what was occurring. But if you watch another television station, they portrayed it as, you know, there's some hooligans out here, there are some thugs out here, um, not a lot happening, there's only about 15 people here, not much going on, they've got a couple signs, look at this guy, it says America's most wanted, America's most threat. So they choose to focus on those types of things versus tell the true story. But we had our iPhones, so we were able to tell our story via Twitter, via Instagram, and, and via these different live streaming apps. So we could tell the truth and so we can control the media now, which is really interesting and powerful and have millions of people um, watching at our disposal. Nice. I think we have a call and then I want to get to your comment. Uh, caller, what's your question or comment? My comment and, uh, is to say about the youth media. That's what we were talking about the youth media. My name is Victoria Rogers. Uh, it's said, like you were saying, my brother got killed the same day Annie Yates, Annie Yates' brother uh, killed her kid. He was murdered to a hotel from this day on. They never put it on the news and it said we it took us three weeks and we still can find out who killed him. No, I'm sorry. But so what hear you that. say about the news media, they pick what they think is best that mm -hmm. people want to hear. Mm -hmm. But we need to put more things on by our family getting murdered and killed. Mm -hmm. And they never said nothing about it. you go to the police department, different places. They can't give you no no answer. It's just like they pushed to the side. Mm -hmm. And so I understand what's going on. We, that, the young people now, I'm proud of them speaking out. They are speaking out, and the attorneys, I appreciate you all for bringing these things to the, to the, to the twofold. Well, thank you for calling in. And again, we're sorry to hear about your family, but, but thank you for calling in. Mm -hmm. Thank you, darling. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.
Yes, I think that's important that um, what she's saying, that we are the authors of our own stories. Who's best to write our stories than us? Mm -hmm. So the thing is, the social media is our way of becoming that reporter because the thing is like so many things you don't see and the media will go for everything negative if it's for African Americans and then like they'll go for a, for a protest that's horrible but won't show the peaceful one so they want they want us to look like a deviant behavior or a deviant race so the thing is yeah they're going for that because negativity sorry attracts more attention than positive stuff mm -hmm. especially for African Americans they'll report something negative about us so quick <laughs> And the, and the caller brought up an interesting point is that, you know, during these sensational eras, there are other things going on. So when Andrea Yates was going the, the her trial was going on, obviously there were other issues going on, but if they spent the whole news cycle going over every single detail of that case, these other cases were being excluded. So uh, that, that brings the point up. So what is, what's important enough to cover uh, and whose perspective is that? So, and that's pretty much what we were going at earlier. It's, it's, it's about, you know, those who, who hold the who hold the, the, the traditional forms of media, a lot of times they go for certain things, whereas uh, social media has has uh, definitely broadened the, spoke, uh, the spectrum a little bit. And now I think a lot of news stories are, are realizing what's going viral on social media is something now that becomes newsworthy. So it, it, it does it does add a factor to it. Because you know, Trayvon Martin was an, another scenario that was, it went on social media, it went on fire on social media before it actually caught the mainstream media. And then that became a, it, it became a, a, a a, a case that was pursued and, and, and because people brought it from the, from the ground up. I, you're, I've, you're so right about social media. I mean, the, the amazing critiques about all these media representations from the corporate media were just all over Twitter and people were, were doing such brilliant critiques about Baltimore and Ferguson and now um, Waco, but I mean, the, the, we still have this corporate media that that sadly still matters um, more to more people that um, portray these incidents so different. If we just look at the recent Waco shootings, um, we have, you know, CNN and other um, news outlets describing, and I, I printed out um, a, re a report on this, and so so nine people were shot in this in gang violence, and almost mm -hmm. two hundred people uh, were arrested. And CNN described this incident not as a riot, um, but as a ruckus, a fracas, a brouhaha, issues, trouble, chaos. I mean, nine people were gunned down in a parking lot in a mall where families were and, and police were. So police could have been shot, you know, innocent bystanders could have been shot. And when we're describing almost, or when we ex uh, see almost exclusively peaceful protests, no one's committing crimes. These are protesters. These are people at rallies. They're described in very different ways. And that's, that's the media. We have on the ground problems with how the police respond, of course. And if you look at the footage from Waco, the police are standing around. They're not in riot gear. Um, the protesters are not cuffed. They're sitting on the ground. They're allowed to smoke. They're um, using their cell phone, and it looks like a biker rally with police protecting the, 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 sh the gangsters. But when you look at how police respond to, again, almost exclusively peaceful protesters, they're in riot gear. They, they look like military personnel. So we have those differences on the ground, and then the media's frame exactly um, plays right into that where, you know, of, of course, um, African-American protesters, again, peaceful protesters are called thugs, and um, these white gangsters that have killed nine people um, are uh, described as uh, bikers or, or gang members. So there's a real difference there that thankfully is critiqued on social media, but that the critique on social media doesn't seem to have r risen up to, um, to corporate media yet. And I think the increasing danger in that as well is that perpetuates stereotypes, right? Mm -hmm. So say for instance, I have a belief, right? Totally unfounded, right? So I have this belief about a group of people 
if the media, like anything that is helping to perpetuate that message becomes a catalyst for that belief that I have. So if I'm seeing that these biker, in my perception of a biker gang, like that, to me, that sounds a gang, biker, that, you know, that might be a little bit intimidating. But if I'm listening to the media, oh, it's just a brouhaha. Mm -hmm. That's just like a little scuffle at a high school football game. No big deal. These biker people might be nice. Oh, look, they've got a flower in their hand. So, I mean, it, it takes that idea. And so now my perception may have shifted about what this event was and the gravity of the event. But if I'm looking at a protest, a peaceful protest, you know, maybe some folks in Baltimore, maybe some folks in Houston, no matter where it is. But if I'm hearing the word thug, well, I've got an idea already because of that word, how I've associated with it based upon my experiences. When I see the, hear the words thug and then the images are flashed on the screen of someone that may look slightly intimidating to me, I have no idea who this person is. They could just flash him on the screen. Oh, well, that is the that is the that is a thug. And so now that's my idea of what a thug is. And I think also important to think about is what are the images that are being shown as these young men, as you put them on the screen, as these young men will be seen in the media, if they've been um, have been murdered. Right. What do we, what type of image do they show of that young man? Mm -hmm. Are they showing Mike Brown in his cap and gown? Or are they showing Mike Brown with a backwards hat? And, uh, and, uh, and his pants sagging. You know, what type, of, what type of image are they showing of these people to continue to perpetuate these stereotypes? And that's the danger uh, with, this type of, with this type of media. Yeah, and uh, yeah, that's, um, that was a great project. Actually, one of my law school classmates, uh, CJ, uh, he actually did a project that was called If They Gun Me Down. Uh, how would they portray him? How would they portray me? So they have, there was a project that was done on social media where a lot of, um, a lot of people were showing, the, you know, which picture they show a picture, maybe in a graduation outfit, or maybe uh, his. I think his. He was given a speech at his his uh, commencement graduation. President Clinton happened to be there, and then he had one where he had a Halloween co costume on, as a rapper. So uh, you know, a lot of people were posting their pictures. You had people who were in their uh, army uniform versus, you know, they might have been had. They might have had a bottle of alcohol in their hand. And usually, a lot of times, the corporate media has shown the bottle of alcohol picture as opposed to the, the picture where you're giving, um, where you're 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 giving, um, you know, a commencement speech. Uh, so that that was a very interesting critique, um, and, and I, it was very relevant because it's, it's still very pertinent. That was the we saw it play out with uh, Mike Brown. We saw it play out with Trayvon Martin. You hear all these. Uh, even with Tamir Rice, they, I think they start going into his family history and that his stepfather was a, um, you know, uh, I think an alcoholic or something like that. So, you know, whether that had anything to do with him getting shot <laughs> right. by the police. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, we hear all these things and I think that was a, uh, th that is definitely a critique. And we, we should be aware that that those things do happen. So when we see them, we can call them out for what they are. And, 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 and typically the media right now, social media, calling those things out. And, and drawing the, the, the mainstream media to be, uh, to be accounted for. Yeah, you know, thinking about what you just said, <clears throat> I was at a, this um, talk one time and we were talking about who is the, the right victim, right? Because when um, Tamir Rice or when um, Mike Brown, Eric Garner, right, it was supposed to be these, these little cigarettes that he had, right? What, what type of victim was he the right kind of victim that was killed? When we look at um, the eight trans women that were killed, what, what type of victim? Is it because they're trans and folks aren't, uh, don't understand what's going on, so, they don't, so their death is different? Whereas if we look at other victims, then it would be this point that we'd have to make sure that we go after them, that we make sure there's justice. But there you know, is not justice for these types of victims. Mm -hmm. So it, 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 it really just shows how much um, this oppression, this marginalization, that even in death, there's still this way to to stereotype or there's still this way to just kind of um, do, do away or just forget about um, this group of people. Most people don't realize, like, even the, uh, this is, there's nothing new about that. Um, even the, the Montgomery Boys boycott, most people don't realize Rosa Parks was not the first person to, to give up a seat in the Montgomery area. Mm -hmm. There was a, a young teenage mother well, a young teenage young lady who who was a teenage mother, who they decided to you know to overlook because you know and especially in the when the fifties when this was going on they wanted to make sure they had a uh, a very credible uh, person to, to to be the forefront of this movement. So Rosa Parks, who happened to be, uh, they they chose her. Uh, because they know that they would not be able to go and say, oh well, now you have a, you know, you have a, you are, you know, you have a morality issue because you have uh, a child out of wedlock, or, or or you have a uh, arrest record because you were stealing something when you were 10 years old. Those kind of things. So uh, there's nothing new. Uh, 
it's just something that should be addressed at this point because it has been a, has been an issue. And I, I think they knew that in the civil rights movement. They chose not to address that directly because they had other issues to face. But um, it, it is nothing. It's absolutely nothing new. I want to um, just bring it to a model. Let's use Hero, for example, and let's use it for the trans women. The only thing they spoke about was trans women, men in the women's restroom. They never mentioned anything about a trans female, I mean a trans man or anything like that. So the thing is, like, they put, they pick and control what they want to scare, the, you know, playing on the fears of society. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that was just really, like, why is it? Or do they not think trans men exist? Or do they think that, you know, you're painting, the, you're painting the image that a trans woman is gonna go in there with a beard and be looking for somebody to have something to um, pedophile somebody or something mm -hmm. like that. That's not the image. So basically you're giving trans women this image that society is taking your word as defining us, which is truly not the way that rolls. Mm -hmm. So I do believe the media controls the image. And I do believe that the media does find some aspects of trying to define how we view and how society views things as a whole and groups that into that and control it like no matter how much we fight it we do fight it a lot we do use social media but the thing is like you said it's a bigger entity they control it it's a corporate company you know they're going to steady use that the thing is that i only feel like that we being in this society every voice is important if you see something that's occurring and you don't feel speak up about it because all it takes is one person to open and one set of ears to listen to start the conversation mm -hmm. and that's something that i mean I'm, we're seeing it more with social media which mm -hmm. i'm really happy but like for trans oh it's just crazy like the hero i just kept shaking my head like i have never seen a, mere, a man with a beard in the restroom saying he was transgender <laughs> well i think it it says so much about what people think transgender is. And if they think that a trans woman is um, really a man, you know, that's a man and he's pretending to be a woman or dressing up to be a woman, that's how they view it, isn't it? Like, oh, it's a man going into a restaurant, a restroom. No, it's a woman who happens to be a trans woman. But it says so much about how they think about trans issues and, and gender. That gender is, you know, a binary system. It's set at birth. It never changes. It can't possibly change. And if it does, it's a, it's a pathology. It's a perversity. And I think that, that's part of the focus on, you know, these men um, and, and I think there is this image of like a, a cisgender looking man with a beard mm -hmm. going into a women's rest, restroom because that fits their idea about what gender is or should be. Mm -hmm. I think we, let, let's take this call. Uh, caller, what's your question or comment? Yeah, um, I wanted to, uh, yeah, sorry, I just wanted to kind of piggyback on what the uh, last uh, person said in terms of why I feel that the uh, folks uh, are really attacking trans folks right now. Since they're about to, since our opponents are about to lose, and we hope that the Supreme Court rules, I uh, say correctly, on the marriage equality issue, they, the, the history of conservatives has been to find some group to attack whether it was fem is it women, and say whether it was the gay rights movement, it was the pushback against the uh, civil rights movement itself. Uh, now they need to find another group to attack and organize against. And this now the our right wing opponents are basically using trans people as that group to demonize, attack, and fundraise again. And yeah, and we and they also know that trans rights issues are international human rights issues. They have no legitimate argument they can use to argue against it. So they will basically uh, say they're basically using fear and smear tactics. I always say that um, it seems like that there's a different population, but the same rhetoric, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's just, every time we're, we're seeing this, we'll, we'll, we'll see that, like you said, the LGB folks, and now the, the T folks, and it's just always something, whether it's black people, whether it's immigrants, whether it's saying Mexicans 
but Mexicans encompassing Mexico, Central, and South America. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so it's always it's always something. I I, I appreciate you just bringing that. You know, speaking about that. Um, and thank thank you so much for calling in. It's just the same rhetoric. It's just. Uh, <laughs> And so it had, and so it's just constantly perpetuated. At some point, it has to take a halt. But I think with this, you know, this new media and just kind of moving up the ranks, I think that may, that's starting this pushback, which I think will, you know, that's helpful. And I think there's a fear that, that some folks have that if the oppressed, right, if they begin to mobilize and they begin to recognize, and we all kind of unite, right? So people mm -hmm. of color, um, our LBGTQ um, folk. Um, if, if all of these groups that are oppressed, just to name a few, if we all become a united front, what would actually occur? And so there's, there's groups that basically function off of that fear. Mm -hmm. And so when we function off of that fear, what do we want to try to do? We want to try to control and we want to try to grasp. So these types of arguments that they present, they're going to continue to feed the machine. So I need to feed the machine because as many people as I can get who want to agree with me in these very short-sighted, very narrow vantage points, I'm going to have these people roll with me because that's going to keep the rest of these people down. If they don't unite, they can never overcome us. So we just got to keep them separate. We got to keep we got to keep all these people away. And that's what I think is very important for us all to stand in solidarity uh, with one another and these different causes. Right. I'm very much so a proponent of Black Lives Matter, but I'm also very much so a proponent of what's happening to our LBGTQ brothers and sisters, mm -hmm. because if we can join and if we can unite um, for with one voice over these causes, because we're talking about inequality, right? We're talking about injustice um, that are happening for all of these communities. So if we can unite, right, right, we can think about all of our different differences, but also what unites us, and we can join together. I think that it becomes a huge amount of momentum that just cannot be stopped. Yeah, that's a great point. A uh, great point. Yeah, and and interesting. And what's what's really sad about the 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 rhetoric that's been used, the fear tactics that's really been used for you know a lot of a lot a lot of for decades and actually longer than that is that it, it actually is 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 against the interests of the people who usually feel that way right. uh, ultimately people vote against their own interests I mean, you, you know that, that they've been showing all these maps of you know all these very poor states where all these people are voting for interest that are uh, voting for these people who are who are giving most of their their uh, their attention to the very top, they're, they're the job creators, so to speak. Uh, they're giving all of the the benefits to the people who are who have nothing in common with the people who are voting for them. But because they have identified the LGBT population, uh, it used to be you know they're gonna you know the, the issue was busing. We, right. You know, we don't want to bust these people over there. Now it's we don't want to have these dudes in the restroom is, is the, the battle cry. So what, I mean, it's, it's all fear tactics. It, it really makes no sense. And then people end up voting against their own interests. They would much be, be in a much better position if they voted for somewhere that was not, uh, you know, that was not cutting breaks for, for the very top and let, allowing the wealth uh, distribution to go uh, to somewhere that, uh, completely away from their, their, their uh, from the middle class up to the, the very upper echelon. So that that's the the part that's the most tragic about it, and, and that's why it should be called out. So because it it hurts everybody, but it, it's very it's, it's it's extremely ironic for the people who are the ones sucked in by the fear tactics are voting against their own interests. And then it's a small group with a loud voice, and they actually go around the country. Mm. So to do this, I mean, you'll you'll hear um, people up in Springfield. There was a really harsh battle trying to get their um, their ordinance together and so the same folks that were down here fighting against our uh, equal rights ordinance were also up there you know doing the same thing spreading these fear tactics so it's like this vaudeville right like this moving <laughs> this traveling traveling bus of <laughs> bigot train right yeah the bigot train right <laughs> east and west of the Mississippi anyway but <laughs> um, but um, so one of the things I want to talk about um, is about these intersections. So we've been talking a lot about racism, you know, but there are identities that people carry. I mean, um, I identify as a black lesbian woman, right? And so there, that has um, different things that I have to see, uh, that, you know, different perspectives that I kind of view life from. And how do we... How do we balance that within 
as we are kind of navigating through the space. So, for instance, you have um, an LGBT person who may be white, right? And then versus you have this LGBT person who is a person of color. And so navigating through those spaces, there might be these uh, different issues. And, and what happens when you're going through that space, if that makes sense, what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, <laughs> okay. So how, so you're basically saying, how do we, uh, how do we make sure we bridge all the gaps, uh, all the intersections? So we may be, I may be, uh, I may not have the exact same uh, commonalities, but we have some commonalities. And how do we bridge those commonalities? Um, I, I think it's just, ultimately, it, it's, you know, there's, we talk about civil rights, but ultimately they're human rights. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and inequality is, is basically dehumanizing. Uh, inequality is basically when somebody, a group has been dehumanized or, or been, uh, b value has been diminished. So it, it shouldn't matter. Uh, I, I think we, we, when we all realize, uh, we should all realize what, what is it that's, you know, what is your different perspective? How is that affecting? Uh, and and, and you, we should have some empathy for each other where we should be able to put each other in each other's shoes. And I think that's usually what happens, wh why people are okay with, you know, people being, uh, marginalized or dehumanized or, you know, okay, that's bad that, you know, this, this group has poor school and probably has not a good chance, but that's, sorry for them. Mm -hmm. And they don't see it as, this could be my child or this could be me and it, this could have been my plight in life. Uh, so I think once we, 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 if we're able to at least uh, get out of our individual boxes and our individualism and, and be able to step in each other's shoes, we really could see how many more commonalities we have. And and we should be and we should be we should feel uh, we should say that's that's wrong uh, even if it's not necessarily my issue. It sh we should we should take up arms. Like, okay, I'm not a, I'm not uh, I'm not maybe I'm not a member of the LGBT community, but I don't want to see anybody in the LGBT community discriminated against. Still, uh, I don't. You know, I, I that it should it's just wrong. So I, and I should have some. I should have a, uh, a certain level of empathy, and I wouldn't want this to happen to me if I was in that particular position. So why why would I allow it, or why would I not speak up for it if it uh, happens to somebody else? We are so isolated now, right? I mean, in the communities in which we live in, the ways in which we live, I mean, you can very well, just with the way that these communities are designed now, I never have to leave my bubble. You know, I could work in this bubble, I can play in this bubble, I can shop in this bubble, and I never have to go outside of this world. And if I never have to go outside of this world, I'm never really aware of what's happening around me. Uh, and I don't have to watch TV, you know, so I don't have to feed into any sort of media. So I could just live in this rosy colored world and everything is wonderful here for me. But until, as he said, until I step outside of this, until I um, pay attention, or at least care to pay attention, or even be aware of what's going on around me, I'll never have have an appreciation realistically for what someone else is suffering through because I'm just living here. So yeah, when I separate myself from the issue, when I say Freddie Gray was not my son or he was not my brother, he's not my uncle, he's not my cousin, like then he just becomes, oh, it's very easy to vilify him, right? So no, I have no attachment to him whatsoever. That's, that's like he said, that's them, it's not me. You know, but when we start to really look at these people, look at these folks, like these are human beings. We all want the basic same we have the basic same needs. We all want basically the same things. Um, if I was oppressed, what would I want for someone to do for me? And so I think it really um, has to do with stepping outside of com our comfort zones. That's not something that you would naturally be inclined to do. Like, let me put myself in an uncomfortable situation. Mm -hmm. That's not something that folks would naturally do. But if you really want to, if you really say that I stand for justice and I stand for equality, then you can't turn a blind eye to what is happening to these other groups that are being oppressed. So it's it's actually being intentional um, about exposing yourself um, to different situations, different circumstances. And I think even having dialogue like this, um, just being around, asking questions, seeking to understand um, what other people are going through, and then asking, how can I lend a hand, mm -hmm. you know? So I think that's what it really comes down to. So when I think about the box, I'm always dissecting some to a different thing. I always try to wonder or question, why are you, what, why are you afraid to step outside this box? Mm -hmm. Is it the fear of being judged or, or you, do you feel that because my issue hasn't been dealt with or it hasn't been fairly justified or have justice to it, I don't feel like I can focus on yours. So I think the thing is that we have like, we weren't designed to fit in boxes, but we squeeze in ourselves in our box, in that box, which is hindrance, but we're failing to realize that all these issues around the table 
inter, interlock. Mm -hmm. You know, the thing is that nine times out of ten, we really don't want to address something until it comes into our bubble right. or come into our box. But the thing is that it could be already there, but are we hiding it? Are we keeping it a secret or what? Are we just putting a blind eye to it until like, it could be there for years, like one person in there, but then when you start getting five, oh, we need to start paying attention to it. Now, this and that. No, that's, that's the sad part. The thing is that instead of just worrying about um, identify me as human. Like I tell people, no, I'm not trans, I'm not nothing, I'm human first, because that's the way I think that you should identify someone. You know, I know it's hard to separate gender and color and all that kind of stuff, but if you first go into the room and start the conversation that all of us are human, therefore there's no line or box that we could allow ourselves to exist in. Mm. Yeah, that's a good yeah. point. Mm -hmm. mm. So, I guess moving in, and you may have already kind of touched on this, but what can people do to stand in solidarity or to be an ally? Some people use the term ally. Some people don't like the term ally because they feel like it's just checking a box. Some people like the term stand in solidarity. So um, however you would, you know, you choose to view that. But how does one be an ally or be or stand in solidarity with with oppressed groups? I know one recognizing that there are oppressed groups, which which keeps it. Wouldn't that be like that? Would be something like how each person identifies. I mean, defines it. You know, mm -hmm. to a sense. You know, if I view this as, mm, okay, I understand it and I respect it. Oh, I consider myself an ally. Mm, you know, it just depends on how I feel like allies being there, dealing with it, and being. Let's talk about it. Let's find a way for it to coexist and be cohesive as a unit. Some people just feel like saying, if I don't, if I'm not judging. Minute, judgmental about it, I'm an ally. That's not, you just, you're switching. <laughs> you're not nothing, you're just standing there. You're like, you're that point just right here. Oh, I'm not gonna be this, I'm not gonna be that. That's not an ally. So the thing is like, I think that we really need to acknowledge that, hey, this exists. So, okay, yeah, I know that this is the, okay, I wanna know more about it. The thing is that we don't go and get the information more about a lot of situations or a lot of causes and stuff. So therefore we limit ourselves with what's on the media and social. The thing is that sometimes if you actually get into it, the root of it, into the nucleus and the ground of it, you get more of an understanding that's not out there on social media or in, the um, society like that, you really, we don't want to step inside that area. So the thing is like, let's plant some greens in with the corn. Mm -hmm. You know, let's plant some um, some kale in with the mustard greens. You know, let's get that. And that's the thing we really need to plant ourselves in certain different soils at times. We're not allowing ourselves to evolve as a society. Instead, we're sitting right here. Mm -hmm. So the thing is, when are we going to evolve? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll, I'll go further. I think it's just speak up. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, like like Atlantis was just saying, so many people are quiet, and I think that's you know the biggest issue because when everybody's quiet, it only takes a couple of people to, to to navigate the decision. And it's kind of like you know if you ever look at the back of a bottle of uh, you know household cleaner, is majority of it is, is is some inert material, and you have the little bitty piece of, of the active ingredient that that does the thing. And that's that's kind of how people work. It's, it's only a few people that really push the conversation. The people who are really loud on usually both sides of the, uh, of the argument are the ones who usually navigate the situation and it's only the, the vast majority of people kind of just are in the middle. So if you want to be an ally, if you, if you really should be, you should speak up. Uh, don't just let somebody else make the decision. Speak up if you, if you feel that it's wrong and just, well, that's wrong and I hate to see that for them and I'm not going to say anything. Well, then you become part of that, that inert group that doesn't, doesn't do anything and, and then the, the, the loudest voice wins in that regard. So... Um, I think speaking up is, is a big deal. Uh, speaking up and, and making sure that you're, you you um, you you articulate because then your the way you bring it may 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 change the conversation a little bit for somebody else and 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 thus you know so on and so on until till the conversation maybe does get framed in the right light uh, to ha have a, a real conversation instead of you know all the the, the the fringe theories that that you know that will never happen or doesn't ever happen but you know. It's like the uh, voter ID, you know, because all this alleged voter fraud that happens and, you know, it's, it's not even on, you know, such a, it doesn't really hardly exist, it, virtually in existence. Or this this random dude who's going to, who's just dying to get into a restroom that never happens. No, there's that, zero cases of, but of course, everybody, that's, that's, the, that's the banner that's been, you know, mm -hmm. stopping, uh, you know, that everybody's been fed uh, if they listen to the media and they believe it, it, it don't happen. It just, it's just not, it don't even exist. So 
why are we why are we not speaking up and realizing that that's a you know when it, when we see those things we need to speak up saying no that that's that's really not how how it really happens that's that's fake that's false and, and you shouldn't be misinformed and be led astray in that regard so for me I think it um it's about really digging in and educating myself um, and it's about exposure and it's about stumbling through it right I've had mm -hmm. some incidents <laughs> I think you were present oh, <laughs> you know so you, you know just being it. just being there but really just digging in and getting involved um, in the lives of those that you want to stand with right if I'm if I'm going to be an ally to you I can't just you know read about you like if I'm really trying to understand um, if I really want to get to know Fran, I'm going to get into Fran's life. I can't just view her from a 20,000 foot view and just say, oh, there's Fran. If I really want to know Fran, I need to dig into her life. If I want to know what's important to her, I'm going to get into involved in her life. So if it means that I'm going to go with her to this rally because that's something that is important to her, which will expose me to something that might be different for me, that for me is standing with you um, because it's what is important to you um, causes that actually matter so I think uh, matter to you so I think that's a really important piece of it as well not only educating yourself not only speaking up but really getting um, digging in with someone and getting involved in their life because I think that really just that whole perspective change is extremely helpful because it helps you t to for me at least it's helped me not to turn back go back to these ways in which I would have thought mm -hmm. it dispels any sort of myths um, any sort of prejudices that my I may have held um, it, it that's what it helps to do and so I think that's another piece that's really important is to really dig in um, with folks and really get in the trenches with them and get to know them and, and to serve with them I think that is really um, that journey. It's it's taking that that journey with folks because I, um, you see people's mind change when they're actually in there, when they're talking to someone, when they're finding out what's going on. Like you said, digging in because then you can see their journey. And even if there was this bias, or even if there was this way that they were thinking, it's fine because we know that that it's changing and that people are changing. It's. So I think just just this journey, and I think um, standing that 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 I think that's um, just really amazing to see the journey because it just we that's how we have to change, you know, because not everybody's going to come in being this advocate or this, you know. I didn't start off as an advocate. I didn't start off. Um, I started off unaware of things. It's just really coming in, coming to the table and getting involved, and that's how I became aware. So I think that education, speaking up, and really digging in, I think that's um, those are very valid points. Um, so, what would it look like, and this is getting idealistic for a moment, okay? <laughs> okay. We got about five minutes. We got about five minutes. Are you serious? What yeah. <laughs> you know, Brandy, you know, you and I, we really got to connect because uh, Brandy and I, we went, we went to the, um, to Selma, Alabama for the 50th anniversary. Mm -hmm. And a lot of, and the president spoke and, and, and everyone that would speak, they would say, you know, we've come so far, we've come so far, and, but we still have a lot of ways to go, you know, that's all I said, but we still have a long way to go. What does the world look like if these phobias and these isms, if they don't exist? <laughs> what does it look like? Like, can we even imagine it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, can you imagine it, right? I mean, but the thing is, how we can't imagine it because, you know, regardless of how much we think, let's use slavery. You know, even though it's not what it was back then, it still exists to some form hidden just in a pretty package. Mm -hmm. So the thing is that I think that even though we can't imagine it, it'll just be some kind of, it'll be a pretty bow on it. Some I don't know, but I don't, like, I don't ever really think that it's going to come to that. I think it's going to lessen and, you know, you're going to have some uneven balances of the scale, but I don't, I know we have a lot of work, but I don't think that we're going to say, I think the earth will be destroyed before we see it. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's just no. human nature. You know, we have, we are a nation built on putting things, categories and labels and this and that, whether they're oppressed, inferior, superior. So we, that's part of our human nature. It's going to be there. The thing is, how do we challenge it? So I think the more of the thing is, what would the fight look like? <laughs> I think that's a great mm. point about the continued struggle that, I mean, I, I think a lot of us have this impression that things are just getting better slow, you know, too slowly, um, but they're, you know, the arc of history bends toward justice, but it only bends toward justice if we fight for it. And we can never, not fight. We must be vigilant. There isn't 
a time to kind of rest on our laurels. It's it's always going to be a struggle. And and it's I mean even though Fran, this is sort of a glass half empty yes. versus glass half full. <laughs> but I think about well, what would things look like if we weren't fighting? Uh -huh. You know, if we weren't struggling, and they would be so much worse. But I I think it's important to to not just assume that things get better just because years are marching on. They've gotten better specifically because people have sacrificed, they've shown amazing courage, um, and they don't stop fighting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think so. I think, um, you know, we can, we can be glad that things are not as bad as they were, but that's, that doesn't set the bar very high, you know. Thank goodness I'm not. <laughs> Picking cotton and, and getting you know, beaten if I don't yeah. get my rations. I'm, I'm, yeah, thank thank goodness that is not going on. And but if if that's all I'm celebrating, then I I'm in pretty bad shape. So, um, you know, I think you know, we, we probably we may not ever see it in our lifetime, but you know, we we definitely while we're here should push towards, and that's one of the things that kind of my life mission is to push leave things better than I find them, and it's kind of like my one of my basic principles. So. You know, part of my time being, being here is to try to make things better, uh, and that for you know for for those who follow me. So I you know think you know if we can if we can say at least we are at least talking about it instead of ducking our head and putting it in the sand, that would be better. We can at least address it and start making some resolutions uh, that try to uh, try to uh, seek uh, justice. Those would be good things. Um, what it would be like to be just. <laughs> You know, I, no idea, but uh, I think we can at least move the, the conversation towards seeking and, and, and actually uh, actually truly seeking justice for everybody and, 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 and move everybody being on board with that. That would be a start, a great start. Very quickly. So I think you got I, the last word. So very quickly. <laughs> I, I do like to imagine that. So I think that a, imagination is so important, and I think as we get older, we kind of forget how fun imagination was to have our little imaginary friends to play house with ourselves and all these other things. So I, I have that in my imagination, and that is kind of what continues to propel me forward because if I continue to look at some of these different incidents that, that have occurred, right, we're talking about the Black Lives Matter movement. If I look at the next shooting and I'm just defeated, then I could probably try to retreat into my own isolation and not continue to work. So I I think I'm kind of summing up what everyone has said. I hold fast to that ideal. I don't know if I'll see it. I would love to see it. It would be fantastic. <laughs> I would celebrate like nobody's business and just dance around the streets for hours and days and years. But um, I don't know if I'll see that. But I do hold fast to that in my imagination. So that's why we keep working. Well, I just want to say um, thank you all for, for coming on the show and talking about this. One of the things that I think is crucial is to have conversations. Yep. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have to have these conversations. I know that it can get uncomfortable, and it can, and, and people. Nobody wants to be called a racist. Nobody wants to be a be labeled a homophobe or anything like that. But until we can recognize that there there are biases out there, that there is racism, there is this institution that's set up, then we can't do something to change it. And so. Uh, continue these conversations, can start up these conversations wherever you are, um, and, and just keep fighting. Like everyone says, we may have to continue to fight, but we keep fighting because um, until the oppressed is free, until we can sit here and say that these trans women can be at the front of the movement, until we can say that, that we can stop all this mass incarceration, we have to, until we can stop seeing people gunned down in the streets with no recourse, we have to keep moving. So thank you all. Thank you for viewing. Thank you for calling in. And I um, have a good night, everybody.